So the apostles were concerned about the fact that they had not brought any bread along. It's a little bit like going, I guess, to your cabin or going off for an afternoon uh, in the mountains, and you're going to have a meal there, and you're far from everything. And whoops, somebody forgot the cooler. <laughs> somebody <laughs> forgot everything. And so that can fixate um, and spoil uh, the whole event uh, because, darn, forgot that bread. And they thought that was what Jesus was talking about when he said, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees, because leaven is not bread. But what's really going on here, if you just check the two or three verses before uh, where our part starts, the Pharisees are saying, what sign are you going to do for us so that we will know that you are the Messiah? This is the leaven of the Pharisees. They want a sign. They don't want faith. They want rather to be overwhelmed by uh, some great miraculous deeds. And that's what the many false messiahs who came along at these times were promising. That just like Joshua of old, they were going to walk across the Jordan River and it was going to part and all this kind of stuff. And they said, and you, you, you seem to claim to be the Messiah. Uh, what signs are you going to do? And Jesus said, no sign will be given to this generation. The leaven of the scribes, of the Pharisees, and of Herod. Leaven was regarded by the Jews as corruption, because leaven in bread is uh, from the old bread that has been corrupted and fermented, and you drop it in the new dough, you know, and it provides uh, the chemical reactions that allow the bread to rise. It has that positive aspect, but here the emphasis is on the negative aspect of what is old and what is corrupt. And uh, we remember at Easter time, Paul says, uh, you are the new uh, bread of Christ. Throw away the old leaven. And so Jesus is saying to his apostles, the fact that you are so concerned about bread uh, after all you've seen, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes and so on, means you have not understood. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God. Bread will be provided. You saw how I provided bread, not just for 12 lunkheads like you, <laughs> for thousands, thousands of people who were with me in the desert and with us listening and starting to drop from faint because they were without food. So where is your faith? See, it all comes down to faith. Not to wonderful and miraculous deeds. Not the prosperity gospel. There's such a corruption, really, of the gospel that is going on so many of our lives when certain pastors and messianic people promise, you know, a fatter wallets and uh, better jobs and a prettier wife. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think they're promising that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it'll come to that. Um, this the, the leaven of the scribes and of Herod. So Herod was, did not find his joys in, in a uh, materialistic messiah. He didn't want any competitors. He found his joy in being king and having the best army and having the nicest palaces and in flouting his power. So really the Pharisees and Herod were in the same boat <coughs> They wanted their cake here and to eat it too. They wanted to live by bread alone. They wanted a materialistic kingdom. They wanted a kingdom of this earth. And the apostles, and of course each one of us, if we're honest, have this tendency that we keep sliding into ourselves, is to want our joy 
and our happiness and our success and our fame and um, our satisfaction all here. And Jesus is saying, no, you have to seek the deeper things, which means you have to pass up some of these more superficial things. And we have the first reading as a good example tonight. We're using the daily readings today. A good example of a man who waits, Noah. All of humanity had been corrupt, was beginning to live for this world only, and of course, fomenting the injustices, the unhappiness, the violence that comes when everybody is king and everybody is God. And so God regretted that he had made the human race a human sort of look at what they imagined God must be feeling and experiencing. And he was sorry that he made us. But there was one man who was faithful to God and who pleased him, Noah. And so God said, through Noah, I will start again. I will start the human race again. And Noah, I don't know if any of you remember Bill Cosby's um, uh, rendition of Noah. It must be on something online. So Bill Cosby, Noah. Do it, and, and uh, I hope you'll find it. But he's, he's talking, he's, he's a comedian, you know, for you. <laughs> I know that's funny because the years are going on, and some people don't know it. But... but um, uh, Bill Cosby has talked about Noah out there in the middle of nowhere building this huge ark and people are laughing at him and like, what are you doing? There hasn't been rain here for a long time. It's sort of like Tucson. <laughs> and then, of course, the rains come and Noah takes his family of seven and all of these uh, progenitors of the, of, the, uh, <clears throat> of the animal kingdom with him into the ark because... He was willing to live with the ridicule of this world. And he was willing to <coughs> worship and listen to an invisible God. Not a God who was promising another great old party this Friday night. But a God who was promising salvation and a new beginning. And Jesus is saying, it is faith that I need in, in you, disciples, and in each of you each of us. Not faith in things going right. Not faith in things going wonderfully. But faith in me that I will feed you in a mysterious way that perhaps you will not know is even happening while it's happening. I will save you. I will put you in my ark, which is the church. And I will give you safety and I will take you home. Look for the long uh, road, Jesus is saying. Um, and that's what each of us are asked to do by our, our Lord. We have to look for the long haul and, um, and realize that the, uh, the truly wonderful things are often so hidden. The truly extraordinary works of God are in the ordinary. We should not look beyond the ordinary of daily life in the family, of daily life trying to carry our own uh, humanity around and live with our poverties and live with our weaknesses. We should not be humiliated uh, by ourselves and by life and look to the rich and the powerful and the beautiful people uh, to say, oh, if only I were like they. Their cross is far heavier far heavier because oftentimes they're living in a great deal of illusion or they're tempted to do so. Uh, whereas we who have some crosses, some challenges, who live in great ordinariness are being asked by God to see him here. Now I know and I am deeply grateful for the fact that so many of you have been praying uh, for my healing. Yeah. Uh, many people use the words in, in the beautiful letters and cards and so on that I gave you. They were storming heaven for you. And I, I deeply appreciate that. 
But I also know that um, while well, God certainly can give me a miraculous healing, and it will take that because the latest medical news is not so good. Uh, there's still uh, some of the tumor left in my head that they didn't get. There is probably uh, some cancer growing in my lungs uh, and maybe in a couple other places. So, you know, cancer is, is sort of ganging up on me. So now we know that uh, if I'm cured, it is a miracle. It isn't my, the fact that I juice carrots or that I <laughs> turned out all that good meat, you know. I'm not curing myself. It would have to be.